Welcome back, my friends, to the Sweet Spot, where IT leaders bring insight to other IT leaders and others that want to be leaders. And as always, I'm here with my two co-hosts, Howard Holton and Paul Lewis. Hello, guys. Hey there. How's it going? And today we have an awesome guest with us. We have Mike Davidson from Microsoft. Hey, Mike, how are you doing? Hey, I'm good, thanks. How are you? Very good. Mike, I heard that you're an architect at Microsoft. Give us a little bit of a detail of what that entails on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, Microsoft is a great company, it's a big company. So tell us a little bit about your role in there. Yeah, for sure. So uh, thanks for having me, first of all. My name is Mike Davidson. I'm an architect at Microsoft. So I work in a place called the Microsoft Technology Center. You know, for those who have kind of been in the IT game for a while, you can think of it almost like a distributed network of executive briefing centers. But instead of maybe a marketing bent on it, it's meant to be staffed by people who are a little more technical. Right. So my background is in software development, educated in math. So machine learning and analytics is a bit of a sweet spot for me. Um, so that's primarily what I help customers with. So I work in the space of data platform. That's anything from business intelligence, SQL Server. Most of the work these days is on more, I'll call advanced analytics or big data workloads. I look after our portfolio of solutions in the machine learning space. So again, not a data scientist, wouldn't call myself one, but literate enough, I think, to at least advise customers on, you know, who may have that role on how to work with us. And then in the IoT space, which again, you know, Hardware side, certainly not an expert, but at least on the Microsoft software side and Azure, um, pretty good level of expertise there. And there's obviously a very natural affinity between those two platforms or the IoT platform and the data and advanced analytics platform. So day to day for me, you know, customers of all shapes and sizes, our primary focus is on enterprise customers in the central Canadian region. These will be your you know, five banks, government, uh, insurance, and I'd say architecture is really the sweet spot. We'll get into uh, you know, product briefing sometimes the customer just wants to know a little bit about what we do most of the time it's we have a problem of some sort and we'd like to solve it using some flavor of your cloud technology so the day in the life is really going through an architecture design process i'm sure you know it well and trying to help them come out with a solution on the back end of that engagements typically about a day right it's a pre-sales type of activity we're not doing support we're not doing implementation or anything like that i hear i hear you're a low code specialist any thoughts about that? I'm not a low code specialist. Uh, Microsoft does have a uh, bountiful presence in that space, but uh, the irony there, I, I taught software engineering at U of P this fall, so no, I'm a, I'm a high code specialist. You're a high code specialist. <laughs> nice. Well, low code's cool, but I don't know. I find those things turn into code eventually. It's just, you know, it's code by a different name. Whatever. Right. I think the main use is MVP, right? Like low code, yeah, you know, I, I, I find yes. as an MVP, but after that, it kind of has to develop into code. And you've got to, yeah, I'd, I'd say really, I mean, there might be a point hidden there. Yeah, you got to know what the long term evolution of this thing's going to be because if it's going to become a software system, guess what? It's a software system and you're going to customize it. It's like doing anything with something off the shelf, right? If someone comes to you and says, we're going to take an off the shelf product and you know, customize 75% of it, it's not off the shelf anymore, right? whether you're using Python, Java, or, you know, somebody else's magic code language, it's still code, right? right? So if you can keep a handle on scope and like you say, MVP, something on something quickly, we see a tremendous uplift at Microsoft around COVID because, you know, people who never knew they needed an app, needed an app, right? Right. We got to do some kind of data capture on a website. And if I were to, you know, say you can have that, or you can stand up a software stack and find somebody who can program it, right? Getting those low code things off the ground can actually be pretty useful. But I'm glad no you replacement for, I'll say, you know, C sharp, Java, Python, anything like that. I'm glad you brought that up. We've been, we had a series recently, but it still is ongoing about uh, sort of leading IT in a pandemic. And one of the conversations was what we generally refer to as the sort of the digital pivot. So if you had a series of projects that were delivering on some sort of feature function value for the organization, it might now need another set. Instead of having six months to do that thing, uh, and a million dollars. Now you have three weeks to do that thing and a hundred thousand dollars. And what's Satya Nadella is our CEO said this uh, recently. I forget which platform it was on, but you know, it might be somewhat anecdotal, but I think the industry's seen you know two years of digital transformation in like two months. Right. I bet you didn't know you needed fifty thousand people from working at home, but guess what? You have them, right? <laughs> right. That's not a that's not a switch you flip, right? And we even see the buckets of sort of. Uh, thrivers, you know, the online, the streaming media, 
uh, the sufferers, like the, you know, the Disney's, the movie theaters, and then the guys in the middle who might be the most where there's something missing. They have to, they had a physical channel. They have to go to some other thing or they, they're used to getting their products to stores. Now they have to get their products to home. They've got to do something else. And one of the things that I find the most interesting, even though it probably has the least technical appeal, um, is sort of Main Street restaurants where they're used to just people who know the restaurant and come in on a weekly basis, suddenly had to figure out how to deliver and how to have an online presence and how to create a takeout window. And they did that incredibly fast. Boy, I mean, Square Pay and Shopify, right? You've seen massive uptake, like any business that you dealt with that didn't have an online presence before, right? There's now whatever that business's name is, .shopify.com or .squarepay.com. Those have been the two amazing platforms that I've watched because they've allowed me to still transact with businesses that I otherwise wouldn't be able to. Okay. Sorry, Howard, I've been uh, taking yeah, the question. Right. Well, what's interesting is the restaurants that took it even a step further, right? Um, when you look at the at the thrivers versus the the strugglers, um, toilet paper is a really good example. Mm. Those that made uh, toilet paper for a retail channel could not produce enough. Those that made it for a commercial channel suddenly found themselves holding onto inventory, not selling anything, and potentially going out of business and declaring bankruptcy. And what a few really smart companies have started to do, especially restaurants, is they go, we have access to a distribution channel that grocery stores do not, and the consumer does not. And so they started to put together effectively care packages, right? You get two pounds of ground beef, you get some fresh vegetables, you get some, some hand soap, and you get six rolls of toilet paper, mm -hmm. right, as a box that you can come pick up. Nothing that was ever on their menu, not something you necessarily would have thought of, but they really quickly took advantage of social platforms, right? Kind of stepped up their game there and went, since we're delivering anyways, and we have, like, we have no supply chain issue, we have a delivery issue, let's see how we can expand that, right? Um, and I think the interesting thing, you know, that kind of also parallels, right? That's probably the least digital industry, but it also parallels when we look at thrivers and survivors and strugglers, the strugglers are the ones that had the least success with digital transformation. They were the mm -hmm. least digital, right? And the ones that made the transition the smoothest were the ones that had dig digital EX initiatives. They had found some success with DX initiatives and they had already started kind of pushing to that mentality where it's about agility, about MVP, about products, not projects, right? And so it was kind of easy for them to go, okay, well, this is the new thing we're faced with. Let's treat it like the last hundred things we've been faced with and really, you know, push to, to whatever the customer de demand is or the customer need is, even if that customer need is my employees or my customers working from home. I think in many respects, you know, the hardest point, the hardest you know, gap to overcome is the one you mentioned, and that's accepting that it's even possible, right? Once you've done it a few times, it, it doesn't become road. I mean, every project has its own challenges, but just the belief that you can do it, I think is probably the biggest hurdle for most leadership teams to overcome because, you know, they're the ones whose, you know, rear ends are on the line. They're the ones who have to write the check. And ultimately, when they've seen the fruits of that, you know, come, it becomes a lot easier to do it when you've had right. to react to some sort of catastrophic change in the operating environment. And, it's and you, have no, you have no choice to turn down the risk tolerance a bit, right? Maybe I don't require 30 people to make a decision or, you know, RFI, RFQ, RFP, da, 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 da. Well, I can't do that in three week periods of time. Yeah, if you, you know, if your business requires a database of some sort, you're going to pick one. Uh, it doesn't matter right. if the best one. It doesn't matter what Gartner says. It doesn't matter what, you know, your 18 pages of documentation from Strat Sourcing say. You need this thing up tomorrow, right? When it's one of these, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars per day in lost revenue or whatever your business's metric happens to be, right? A lot of the formality is just... Right. <laughs> and, and the question becomes, how many of the, those formalities do we pick back up off the floor and re-implement? And at the end how many of those get even remotely re-implemented the same way? I, I, I'm hoping far less. I mean, as much as this, you know, COVID is obviously a tragedy of proportions we haven't seen, but at the same time, like, like anything in life, hopefully we can learn from it, right? Well, I think we'll either learn or disappear. Yeah. Right? I think, I think companies have two options. You either learn from this, figure out what mistakes you made, what mistakes your competition made, what successes you had, and kind of drill down to what allowed those successes to happen and adopt that as a strategy moving forward. Or you put your fingers in your ear, demand things be different, and either go out of business or, or are acquired and, and you personally are out of business. Well, it's like the whole idea around working from home, right? I mean, some people believe it's, I mean, I might, whether one's preference is, you know, either in the office or not, but 
this idea that someone's ever, everyone's just going to magically go back into an office and resume their 90 minute commutes and resume wasting thousands of dollars on transit. It, it's nonsensical, right? We're showing most many of these jobs can be done at home. And for those that can't, fair enough, but certainly in most of our lines of work, right? It's probably 95% of what it was. I mean, the reality is if you had to show, if you show up to some somewhere that produces a product or interacts with someone that's not your company, there is value in that physical presence being there. Totally. But if you show up to a place where you just interact with other people that are part of your business, probably not a whole lot. Like the value, the value drops significantly. Right. Well, yeah, like you know, part of you know, part of Microsoft Technology Center where I work, it's a center, it's a place. There's all sorts of stuff you can see and experiences and whatnot. It's cool, don't get me wrong, but if I offered that opportunity to most customers, right, you can stay at home in the you know, friendly confines of your basement, your tracksuit, or you can get dressed, waste the money to travel downtown to see the whiteboard. It's cool. Like we have really good whiteboards at Microsoft. They're the best you can buy. <laughs> like it's not taking three hours of my day. Put it out, you know. Right. I'll fire up whiteboard or whatever drawing tool I happen to have on my uh, Microsoft Surface Pro. <laughs> now I will I will say though that 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 interaction in person is significantly more valuable than interaction not in person. Mm -hmm. um, and I do find it interesting. Six months ago, I never would have complained with a phone call. Never. Mm. It was my my preference when I don't have to travel. Let's get on the phone. Let's have a let's have a conversation. Blah blah. blah. Now I complain about a phone call. Are you sure we can't use Zoom? Are we sure we can't see each other? Right. Like, there's a whole lot more context contained. There's a whole lot more nuance that's transmitted. I really I think it might work better if we could see each other. Yeah, I need to see the eye roll. Right. Right. But, right. but in the MTC sense, there is not unlike sort of the Hitachi EBC sense. There's some physical value there, right? So when you go oh, yeah. to the Hitachi, especially in Japan. You can see like the actual manufacturing, right? You can see physical equipment to which we produce, which I'm not sure you can do virtually as well. No, yeah, like part of the experience again is we have demos, we have you know IoT enabled devices. There's an IoT enabled chainsaw in our office or whatever. I don't know what it happened, but that's what we have. Um, yeah, it's hard because like I've, I've probably done 30 or so remote engagements, and for me, one of the hardest parts is. You know, I, I set up my com gaming computer and I have like just toys and I'm constantly fidgeting with something. And I'll right. sometimes forget that I have the camera on. <laughs> like, okay, have I just been fidgeting? Have I been you know, twirling? Like, you know, I have an old knife that I sit in, like, swing a knife around in front of my customers. Like, is, is this right. really hobby? And it's all of those cues you mentioned, right? There's times when, if I, for example, am missing the mark, right? This customer said they want to talk about something. They clearly don't want to talk about that. And they're rolling their eyes, they're checking their phone, they're surfing on the web. I can't see that. Right. All right. So that's the one thing you do is, is an element of that um, being able to read the room. All right. Let's say the strict, you know, the raw delivery, like you wanted to consume this content and have this experience or have these learnings. I'm finding, yeah, more or less we can do. It's the change of course. All right. Oh, I, you didn't tell me you didn't want to talk about the database and you're feeling like you don't want to be rude and say that. But now you're all just, I'm on in the background and you're playing video games and you're watching Netflix and whatever. All right. <laughs> right. You lose that of flexibility. Again, it's like if every, you know, if there was no cost, yeah, we would do it. But you know, the challenge is there's so many costs with respect to travel these days. Mm -hmm. I don't mean international or intra-city. I just mean, uh, you know, like heading downtown, right? Given that people generally are not wanting to be there, that's you know, I find if we can find a maybe happy medium and you know, deliver 80, 90 percent of the value without some of the costs and risks, I think we'll be in a good shape. Yeah, I'd be good with a, a federated delivery of of offices right so maybe we take all those bank branches and make them like little regis centers and you sort of meet in your general location so it's the starbucks meet and greet if they had a coffee machine that'd be great is that like um, we work without all the obnoxious executive behavior <laughs> exactly one of the th world over here is just an office <laughs> one of the side effects of sort of this agile it requirement where i have three week delivery is um, i now can't acquire infrastructure or even complex software in that period of time, right? So now I have to think about um, acquiring more based on what I think the forecast is gonna be. Maybe I acquire them on a quarterly basis instead of on a project by project basis and mm -hmm. allocate per project instead of acquire per project. We've actually seen it pretty dramatically in this quarter in our business. Is, is this something that you're seeing too? Yeah, I mean, in cloud, obviously, the nature of that beast is entirely different. That's been, right. in some sense, the one of the fundamental value propositions from the inception of the platform. Right? We are certainly seeing an uptick in business. There's absolutely no question about it. Right? The idea of, you know, for a lot of people acquiring, for the reasons you cite, 
right? We need this thing up and running now. Imagine a big retailer in Canada that didn't really do a lot online. There's lots of them, right? right. When your entire business shifts online for a couple of months, it turns out that the hardware procurement cycle is just not manageable, right? We used to talk about this all the time. It's, you know, I mean, back when we worked together, I mean, one of the things I always, always advocated when we were talking to people about procurement was, you know, you're going to buy it anyways, right? The money's going to get spent. It's a question of, do you want to have some control over that purchasing cycle? Do you want it to be on your terms or do you want it to be when there's a fire? Mm hmm Right, because when your foot's held to the fire, all of a sudden you know, people know that, and sometimes the answers you're going to get back aren't what you want. Right, your the supply chain doesn't care if you need it now; it's coming in three weeks because that's reality. Right, cloud more or less solves that problem. I mean, infinite is a strong word; it's usually infinite from the perspective of most customers. But frankly, even they run into issues. Right, yeah, we had to make provisioning decisions. You can imagine when Teams went from here to like right. the of my arm can reach literally overnight. Right, we had. It's all the same. At the end of the day, it's all the same Intel chips, right? right. Or yeah, your arm or whoever it happens to be. Um, we had some very well publicized challenges, right? We had to ration, right? You want 500 VMs for your, I'll say, non-essential industry analytics project. You're going to wait. The, hosp the hospitals are getting them first, right? The banks are getting them first. The government's right. getting, them, right? So we do certainly see that element of. Um, it's kind of weird that it's kind of, it's interesting with cloud as we've seen it evolve. We've always talked about on demand, right? Buy it on demand. We certainly incent you pretty heavily to not buy it on demand. Mm. Right? One of the things that's been funny about watching cloud evolve has been the adoption of some of the more traditional business models. Right? Cloud was all about pay as you go. Oh, by the way, if you want to pre-commit one year or two years or three years, we'll give you a big discount off the top, right? All of a sudden it starts to look pretty similar to how things have always operated, right? But it's interesting, um, like this whole conversation, it's not just a technology conversation. It's the difference between just-in-time logistics and how we did logistics before just-in-time, right? Um, it's really supply chain management of whatever the particular supply is that you're looking for. You can either do just-in-time, in which case I have enough for today, and I'm planning ahead for tomorrow, but not for three years from now, or you can take a more traditional approach and look at it from the perspective of, I have a term that I'm trying to aim for, and how do I, how do I have some reasonable, uh, you know, series of success there? Um, and all of it works fine as long as just-in-time logistics doesn't break, right? As long as there's not some big surge or some big catastrophe that breaks the ability for products to move just in time. Well, it's like every premise or model, and it almost sounds stupid, you know, valid until all the assumptions change, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it's like, every, you know, it, it, we find this constantly. We're not resilient to those catastrophic changes, right? We've had brilliant economic models and forecasting models and finance for years. There's just some stuff you can't predict. I think it was LT, long-term capital management was that famous story about they just couldn't predict the collapse of the Soviet economy or the Russian economy. Sure. There's no well, model. No and model the, uh, the housing crash in 2008, right, from bundling the securities. Um, although that was actually well predictable. Uh, the purpose of the of the model was actually to identify um, recessions that had previously been missed by economists by studying the securities market. And banks decided that that sounds like a really good model for making money, which is fine until you hit a recession. Right. right. Like all of these models are fine until you hit the very thing that they're not designed to overcome, that they don't have the ability to overcome. Um, and it's almost like somebody reads the cliff notes and not the full manual. Right. The cliff notes say this is fantastic. The full manual says this is fantastic, except also plan for this. And nobody ever reads the also plan for this. Let's, uh, let's journey into IT leadership. Now we all have operated IT and now we are providers of IT. <laughs> but you get to interface with a lot of IT operators. So are you seeing or have you seen, especially in the MTC sort of situation, an evolution of skill set in IT leaders or a different attention or uh, just different priorities? Is, is there any obvious witness to that? Yeah, I'm just trying to think about, there's definitely, you know, data and AI and machine learning has been a fun one to watch. Mm. There's companies that get it. There's companies that have, you know, kind of long for a long period of time had that in their DNA. Um, what's been interesting is I'll say watching those momentum driven customers try and figure it out. Right. And by that, I mean, well, I went to Gartner CIO summit and I heard that AI is important. So we need to have some, right. I get a lot of these. I'll go, well, what do you want to do? Right. I, don't know. I need AI. You tell me. That's right. 
And it's kind of, you have to, there's a, a kind of level of first principles you almost have to go back to sometimes. Right. And it, it's my nature and I don't, it's not always the right way to do it, but I'm a, I'll say a very deductive thinker. And again, this isn't a you know, humble brag or anything like that, but I like to go from sort of, uh, you know, principle to implementation. Right. So when I, I'm confronted with something like that, it's a lot of education on, you know, okay, well, here's what this thing can actually do. And then can we kind of work through the process to figure out something, right? Whereas some people very much, you know, it's got to be a use case, use case, use case. So I find with AI, there's been a lot of um, pressure put on executives. Hmm. You, you had to be hired a new CDO because everyone has a CDO. Right? We're going to build a data lake because we need a data lake. And then we're going to start doing AI because it's fantastic. Right? Just the cloud. We're required yeah, by the cloud strategy. So what's our cloud strategy? Yeah. Right? Yeah, I can really. you know, go to Azure or AWS. Or AWS. It's, like, it's not a strategy. That's a destination. It's fine. But uh, there's a lot of detail in the middle. Right? So having to, you know, again, it sounds strange, but almost reorient the conversation around business outcomes, right? Because in any time there's gold rush or something, it's like you have to kind of go and do that land grab, right? Right at the beginning. But that's not successful, right? AI is another tool. It's another technique. It's interesting. There's a lot of value with it. Um, it it's not a panacea for anything. Right? Like anything else, it requires discipline, requires expertise, requires practice, right? But that's been a funny one. Um, and again, guiding customers through that sort of emerging awareness of the value of data, right? You've, everyone's heard the platitudes, data is the new whatever, oil, gold, jello, doesn't really matter, right? The idea that you have to go again through steps of maturation, I have observed this catastrophically at times, skipping steps, right? Mm -hmm. Customers will come in and say, well, yeah, we want to transform our business and become a data broker and we want to monetize our data. And okay, well, tell me about your data, right? Well, I have access over here and I've got some Excel spreadsheets and there's an Oracle you know, six database sitting on Bob's desk or whatever. And it's like, okay, fair enough. You may want to get to AI, but you're going to go through a lot of reporting and stuff. Even if you don't care about reporting, just because the AI people are going to want to know where the data is. They're not going to want to wait nine weeks for IT to give them permission to go look at it. They're going to need to know what column is versus column B. All right. I was in a spectacular failure of a project early in my career where you know, a very well-heeled data scientist wound up telling a room full of mortgage people that a mortgage rate was important, right? <laughs> That's key to getting a deal closed. Yeah, it was like, well, yeah, we're, we're looking at this, this big elaborate retention model, and it's like I did all the data engineering. I didn't, I didn't know my way around data science at the time. And imagine, imagine doing this, right? Imagine predicting to a room full of mortgage people that if you lower the rate, people will stick with you. It's like, what? <laughs> You know, it's like we dialed up wetness and stuff got wet. I'm like, all right. <laughs> so it's like, you, you're going to go through that data governance stuff, whether you like it or not. And right. it's ugly, you know, it doesn't give you the big carrot at the end, but the steps are the same. Right? My, my favorite question to ask in those is, um, okay, cool. So you want to get to AI and, and now you want to be a data broker. Um, what does your EIM look like? Sure. And they just go, uh, what's EIM? Right, right. Okay, so let's start over. <laughs> right. I understand EIM is hard. It's probably the most complicated thing you could do in IT, but you can't just ignore it and pray it goes away. Right? Okay. AI is going to make it more difficult if you're starting from zero. You can't just apply it. But I'm, speaking from, I'll say, I'm speaking from the perspective of what I'll say is systematic adoption, right? If you're looking for a project, right? Clearly, I don't need to go back and build my data lake and my entire data governance estate. This is more for almost that, you know, that long tail. Right, the big heavy hitters at the top, you're just going to go do right. If there's a fundamental transform, transformation or business value that's going to come out of that, I'm never going to be the person to tell someone, no, what you really need to worry about is metadata management, right? That, that's stupid. But if it's that sort of systematic adoption, right, we want AI infused into every process, as the you know, you know every third post on LinkedIn says is going to happen, right? That's where the investment in the data estate really becomes, I would say, a necessary kind of precursor to that, right? And that's all. Sure. Awesome. And, and, and I'm not arguing or advocating that metadata management is a required component for every company in every step of EIM, but I do think it's worth having some sort of process that you go through and go, these are the 27 checkboxes. We at least need to identify if they're applicable. Okay. If we've just ignored the fact that they exist to begin with, we're just kind of creating, you know, a data swamp to use that kind of vernacular, right? Well, we're we just do this everywhere, right? It's like applications. We have had, you know, monoliths for better or worse for, you know, how many decades. And I'm going to take that and somehow via, you know, some alchemical process, convert that into 400 microservices deployed with the oh. React front end or with Kubernetes on the back end. It's like, what do you got today? Well, I got a database and there's a bunch of VMs. Right. 
or I have a 30-year-old mainframe application written in COBOL, the developers died, the application is no longer supported, and we're keeping it together with bubblegum and wishes, but we don't really understand how it works. And we're going to move it all the way to serverless and containers, yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, if I were, you know, I don't say relatively advanced stage, but I mean, I got a few gray hairs and some lack of hairs up here, you know, I've been around the block a couple times. The only architectural attribute of the system I can implicitly defend, and by that I mean defend without another requirement, is simplicity. I don't architecture opined that, you know, it's much like Warren Buffett's quote about invest in companies an idiot could run because one day one will. It's build a system a second year college student could maintain because one day one will. Right. Right. I used to call that stuff, those requirements were the EFN, the elves and fairy network. They depended on magic for it to work. Therefore, this is an EFN request. We can move on. Right. There's no reality. There's no realism attached here. They just want it to work by magic. But, and you know, we always fetishize the Microsoft, Amazon, Netflix, and Google and want to architect like them. I mean, they do some fabulous stuff, but they have fantastically interesting problems, right? If you're not building a video distribution for half a billion people, I, I might submit that maybe what you need is a monolith on the VM, right? right. Mm -hmm. And a $50 billion investment over five years. Right, like I another funny one. It's like, I mean, we, you know, customers want to have security conversations about cloud. I'm like, look, we invest more money into this than the profit to our business has ever had, ever. Like the sum of we do it without the the 50 years of technical debt. <laughs> right? I mean but more importantly, the billions of dollars. It, it's <laughs> much but it goes hand in hand, right? You're not getting the billions of dollars and you've got technical debt. Like you're setting yourself up for failure. Um, when we talked again about the 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 thrivers, the the triers, and the and the the failers, whatever we're calling them, I don't <laughs> we keep, we keep renaming these categories. I, I keep do I keep I keep doing it. But but everybody that I talk to goes, we want to be like Amazon, or we want to be like Zoom, or we want to. And I'm like, is supply chain your main <laughs> business? Because I don't I don't know that supply chain is your main business. Is logistics your main business? Like Amazon has a lot you can follow, but but. Do you have fifty billion dollars a quarter to invest in these sort of things? Do you have, you know, the GDP of a small country to make as an investment? Um, and is your company older than the year two thousand? Right. Same with Zoom. Like, okay, I, I think it's fantastic, but do you have venture capital equity lying around? And and is your company like, you know, five years old? Because if it's more than five years old, you have technical debt greater than that five years. And they're like, no, we're a bank. We've been around since nineteen fifty four. Yeah. Right. So you're carrying a bit of technical debt, debt, buddy. Zoom does not have that challenge. Right? But, but, the entire organization is agile from the start. But beyond all that, most of those organizations, the cloud scale organizations, technology organizations, have smarter people than you. Right. They, they are way. We may never admit it, but absolutely the people coming out of Stanford are going to those organizations, not to the first bank of Wawa, right? there. It's not likely you're attracting that scale of organization or skill set or expertise. And therefore, maybe it's worthwhile to rely on their capabilities instead of yours. I would not be so bold, uh, however. <laughs> but, but we know it to be true. And we yeah. also know, since we operated IT, that we know it to be true. Right? We, I probably never said it to Microsoft or Hitachi, but I knew it to be true. There's only so much I was willing to pay the people who worked for me, right? But if, I think it's this this like position of self denial right. that a lot of companies get themselves into that that ultimately doesn't help anyone and especially hurts themselves. Right. If I'm going to do a thing like to to use the the picture that's behind you, Mike, I'm never going to play soccer on that field. <laughs> I mean, if I'm if to be clear, like between the first white line and the second white line, and I'll let you pick out which closeness of lines you choose, I would probably collapse if I had to make that run. <laughs> right? And so like, ultimately, I have to do the same thing as a business runner. Right? I have to look at what are my capabilities, what are my qualifications, what, what, what is my maximum potential? Mm -hmm. and, and frankly, it's hard to compete with places that are paying $300,000 for college grads. It's hard to complete, compete with places that have comparatively an infinite budget. Well, we right. run into it all the time. It's like, you know, we, I've had conversations with people who submit that we need to start teaching data science in kindergarten because it's that important to the world. I mean, it, it's, it's ridiculous. If you look at the number of people who can reasonably call themselves one. I, I consider it to be much smaller than the number who do. I don't call myself one. I mean, I can certainly cite my own education as an own qualification. It's a hard job. It is not easy to do. And 
the number of people coming out of the higher ed system is tiny. Mm -hmm. right? The idea that you're going to just, you know, like you say, you're competing with Microsoft Research. You're competing with like Fair at Facebook. I there's a I've had, I've had two people in the thousands I've ever talked to get this trivia question. So there's a guy named Peter Lee. He at one point ran Microsoft Research Next, which is a very large organization within Microsoft Research, and he talked about the going rate for a I think it's PhD from one of the top schools in the United States in the ML or AI field is that of a rookie NFL quarterback. Right, so I have a slide. This I mean, he was a rookie a couple of years ago. It was a picture of Deshaun Watson, who's now in his third or fourth year, and showed it to you know countless people. And it's like, you know who this is? It's around the premise of because you're not hiring anybody like this. Right, right. you don't have dollars to spend on a data scientist. And it was you know two people who ever got it. But the point being, like, it is rarefied air. You don't have a million dollars a year to pay someone. Your executives don't make that. Your owner doesn't make that. Your company's not even worth that. Okay. You know? Somehow this data scientist is going to walk through the door. It's crazy. Now it's not to say everyone needs to be doing that. Don't get it wrong, but it's just to give you a sense of the scale you're sometimes talking about, right? Oh yeah, we we talk about that all the time, right? Um, one of the questions that I ask when customers want to talk about data science and their data science strategy. Okay, cool. Um, do you have three hundred thousand dollars to pay for an entry level data scientist? I'm like, no. Okay, well the competition does. Right. Right. So how do we how do we better position you to take advantage of the of the assets and resources that you do have? Right? Rather than looking at other people and going, I really wish I could do that when you're not playing in the same league, like let's let's be real about it because it doesn't mean you don't play. It just means you have to have kind of a come to Jesus moment and go, this is how we're going to play. This is how we're going to move forward. This is what's reasonable for us. It's also a question of maturity in that field. Like Much like most organizations don't think they need to write a compiler to run an application, right? We're still in this stage where a lot of organizations think they might have to do the ML equivalent thereof. Right. When the actual answer, of course, is no, you're going to, you know, follow a pattern that someone else has established. You're going to download a library from PyPy and go to town, right? Yep. This architecture from first principles of a computer vision model is insane. Like, because now you're competing with Microsoft Research, you're competing with DeepMind, you're competing with, with brilliant people like Hitachi. And it's like, even if you wanted to, why? Who cares? Is, well, is there actually, since most of the problems are likely BI problems or analytics problems or MIS problems, to which you could solve with traditional technology that they may in fact already have in house. One of my most well-received slides I, I presented anytime I talk on the subject is my AI checklist. I was with the audit leadership team for KPMG and this is one of the people who understood who Deshaun Watson was. Strangely enough, it was like really senior auditor and he was a huge football guy. And they asked me, like, well, I'm keeping hearing, what does a good project look like? So we actually brainstormed this little list and I mean the first thing I will tell anybody is don't make something an AI project that doesn't need to be. Mm -hmm. Right? Have you tried drawing a picture, have you tried basic descriptive statistics, right? If you can get the answer you need out of that, you know, have you tried rules? Like you've actually tried to code the thing. Right. You know what I mean? Like if 15 if else statements or some decision table or lookup table works, you know, it's not an AI problem, it's ridiculous, don't do it. Right. Code it. But then I can't say that I have AI. Then I can't say that we're doing AI, right? And I think it then comes back to the decision-making process in the business that determines the technology is the thing rather than the outcome is the thing. If we're striving for an outcome and the outcome is we want to make, we want to have better decision-making processes. So we're investing in the right place. We're targeting the right place. We're marketing the right place. Start with what does that look like? And then determine the tool that's going to get you there. And most of the time I would agree, it's probably not AI and ML. Well, that was one of the funny experiences I had with my students, right? So I taught, like I mentioned, I taught a university course last fall and they, a big part of it was projects, right? So why they take the course is not to hear me lecture, they could care less, it's more about you get work experience, you get to actually implement something. All right, so we hook them up with a nonprofit or an NGO and they actually get to kind of put hands on keyboards, write some software, right? Very different than what you see in the academic environment. Mm -hmm. The academic environment does not stress these types of skills at all. And so many of them, right, the technology choices were very elaborate. Right? And they got guidance to the contrary, right? With the, and they're like, ah, I'm not gonna use a database, I'm gonna use Mongo. I mean, there's no wrong with Mongo, it's a great technology, right? But the learning curve is going to be a bit different, right? The volume of resources is going to be a little bit different. And it's funny having conversations after the fact with some of them. Like, like, yeah, we had the report on it. It turned out to be a real nightmare. It's like, hmm. The price, the price, the price. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's like, well, why did you pick it? Well, we need to scale. It's like, scale what? Your demo? Like, you got, you're writing a website for 50 people. You don't need to scale anything. 
you know, I was trying to be honest with them. I tried, I didn't want to make the course into a Microsoft marketing event. So I tried to teach stuff from Amazon and whatnot. And there's this body of knowledge Amazon's put together where like, they're, they're broadly for the purpose of scale, not recommending some of these, you know, non-traditional database technologies until you're talking about millions of registered users. Right. right. It's, it's very often, I think we overstate the need for scale. Plus we overstate what's important to a business. Like there's been many pieces of software and hardware we've bought that the decision was based on us not wanting to be called at 3 a.m. to fix it, right? There was a, there was a substantial amount of skill set that we had a 1-800 number that was actually answered by some professional, right? I don't want to have to Google at 3 a.m. to figure out what, you know, how to solve this problem. Oh yeah, it was like, I got grief early in my career. It's like someone's, you know, well, what about your rep? I'm like, my what? <laughs> like, I'm be the open source guy. I'm like, I love open source. It's great, but like, I'm I like watching television. I like playing video games. But I'm going to do that. And when this thing breaks, I'm going to call my friends at IBM, Oracle, and Microsoft. I'm not right. Rigging it myself. Why would I do that? We also have this false impression that new equals better. Mm -hmm. Right. The new database equals better than the old database. No, no, no. It's specifically to solve a specific type of problem. Do you have that problem? Like, you know what's great tech? MQ series. MQ, like, that, that thing literally has never died. Nothing goes wrong with it. It's bulletproof. Mainframes, they work. I, 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 don't right. want, you know, I don't want my banking transactions running on microservices. Go away. Don't do that to me. Like, <laughs> I don't want the pod running out of memory and then having to reboot and I got to redo my transaction. I would like to know that Z series is there or whatever platform it is, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying don't modernize, but I mean, what a guard called bimodal right there's some stuff you're not going to touch and it doesn't make sense to touch it right the systems of engagement on the other end sure throw some services on that place there's a lot yeah. to be said about breaking stuff and it's not like we're at a, we're at 97 percent modern right it's not like our modernization strategy is so complete that all that's left is the stuff running on mainframe no oh, it's like what well, they yeah, it's you know, motor-based decision-making is FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. It's like, well, everyone else is doing it, so I got to do it. It's like, all right, hold on. Yeah. Everyone else is, in fact, not doing it. <laughs> well, they are, but again, it's incremental, right? I mean, IT in 20 years will look nothing like it does now, but it's not a big bang, right? It's like, you know, the hard part of any architectural initiative is not this. Architecture, I always find, had this broken model of states, right? I mean, if I had more, I'd say, academic time on my hands, I'd love to write this, but... We talk about this idea of the to be architecture, and we have this current state as is, and we have the to be, and we shall progress mightily from A to B. And it's like, that's easy. You know what I mean? Painting the end state is not hard. It's what are you going to live with in the five years it actually takes? Because you don't just wave a magic wand as, you know, using your term elves and fairies, right? There's no magic wand here or fantastic creatures that are going to make this happen for you, right? It's the what you have to live with in the interim and how you're going to make those transformations livable that really characterizes challenge in IT. Drawing a PowerPoint, what tomorrow looks like, or similarly implementing it. Right. Whatever. Right? right. It'd be great for that two lane road to be four lanes in the morning, but do know the duration of making it four lanes, some of it will always be one lane until it's all four lanes. Yeah. Right. So, how much of that are you willing to be one lane and for how long? And that was always the theory to me. It's like when we talk about states, it's like it's either, you know, micro states or vectors, right? It's like, can you think more about direction and think less about where I'm going to wind up and just think about, you know, goods over there. Right. I maybe overshoot it if I'm not quite there. If it's not perfect, I can live with that, right? That's good because I don't. I don't know what the future is, anyways. If I could do again, advice I give anyone: if you could predict the future, we're not doing this. Right. This is for my house or my Malibu mansion or whatever, right? You can't predict the future, so it's like, can you at least just make things better, right? And thinking right. about you know little maneuvers you can do to keep doing that. Yeah. I've always found that to be a viable way to think about the, I'll say, organizational practice of architecture, right? Not in a, any system or, you know, for any one particular initiative, but broadly as the organization thought about investment. Yeah, I like a Kaizen for that, right? The philosophy of continual improvement. Let's erase the, the, the fact that there's a goal, because as soon as we get close to that goal, we're going to realize there's, that's not the goal. Right? It, at best, it's a goal. And so instead, how about we imbue the organization with this philosophy of continual improvement, simply making it better today than it was yesterday. Because of course we stop once we reach the goal, right? It's like, I'm going to deliver the three-year architecture vision and I'm like selling hot dogs or something, right? Like, no. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> well, I'm done with this one. Time to move right, on. Right, right. So, Time to move on. <laughs> it's all back to you done, right? And of course, no, there's always something new. There's like a new pandemic. There's going to be... It's like you think of, you know, I always remember these exercises in long-term horizon planning and it's like, 
can't for, I mean, the Microsoft, people always want to talk about Microsoft's three. Tell me the three-year roadmap. I'm like, nobody knows the three-year roadmap. That's right. Let me tell you the one year. I'm sure they have thoughts on it. Sure. I'm sure you guys have thoughts on what your roadmap looks like, and then things change. Right. right? Well, imagine your 10-year IT plan back in 2010. It was a joke. <laughs> that plan's worthless. It's nonsense, you know? Sure. The real joke with that plan is that you assume this massive modernization of all of your applications and equipment, and you're still at 70% not current. You still have a bunch of software you don't have source code for. Arguably, you still have the same people you had back then. So it's like, clearly you're not gonna evolve if you have the exact same team you currently have. All right, one more topic before we end, because we're kind of in the 40 minute mark here. Um, we are all Disney files. So what, what is the minimum standard for you to get back to Disney World, Disneyland? What has to be true for you to get back there? Oh, that's a really, that's a really good and interesting question. Um, yeah. My wife being okay with it. <laughs> then what's her minimum standard? What has to be true for her to go back to Disneyland? She, she hasn't quite figured out how to get to the grocery store without anxiety. So <laughs> right. I, don't think, like, I, think, I think that's more of that kind of 10 year IT plan. I think it's too far in the future for me to understand today. Um, I mean, ultimately, there has to be some level of calm outside of Disneyland. Like if I'm mm -hmm. going to pack myself into a place that doesn't, that, that I can't conceive, conceive of a way that they could really do social distancing and maintain it, like they may have some ideas, but when the when boots hit the ground, I'm not sure that they're going to be able to do it. Then everything outside of Disneyland has to have a relative level of safety. Mm -hmm. Right. If Disneyland reopens, all of the hotels nearby are going to be full. All of the restaurants nearby are going to be full. Um, and I find it hard to believe that, you know, the, the IHOP two doors down isn't going to be, you know, asses to elbows. Um, right. The, the, there simply isn't the infra infrastructure around the Disney parks to sustain a social distance version of that number of people. That's like, definitely true of land. World is far more space comparatively. It does, but it still doesn't have the infrastructure. Like, okay, you That's have right. like you have the distance for cars, you have the parking. Yeah. But but if you were to social distance restaurants, you now need three to four times as many restaurants. They don't exist. Or capacity is at twenty percent. But it's not just that, it's the buses, it's the monorail, it's the ferries. <laughs> it's 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 literally everything involved. It requires some sort of lineup. Right. Yeah. Or you know, multi massive people in a small room. Mike, what's what's your thoughts? What's your minimum standards to getting back to Disney World? Yeah, I mean, just you know, for <clears throat> excuse me, observer who doesn't know me, I've been man like 20, 20 ish times like all the year growing up. Like I've been a lot, no, at least enough compared to the general public. Yeah. Um, I hate to say it, but probably vaccine or treatment. Interesting. Is what I'm. You know, I like it. I've been enough where you know not a lot changes year to year, right? So, and I, I just don't want to go and have a compromised experience. It's not interesting to me to every moment I'm there, you know, to your earlier point, Howard, worrying, okay, is this person close to me? Is the line having social distancing enough? Do I, am I sitting far enough away on the Space Mountain ride? Is this table far enough away? I don't want to worry. It's a vacation. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have more worry than I have at home. Right? As much as I love the experience, which I do, right? It's just, it doesn't feel like something I'm ready to entertain until I can go and have the experience I want. Okay. Well, I have, a, I have a question. Um, how much would you pay for an increased ticket that does enforce social distancing, that cuts the number of people by, you know, by cuts the number by five, cuts the number by 10, right? Would you pay a, a, a massively inflated price? Because there's no way to just double it, right? Okay. Would you pay two hundred fifty dollars? Would you pay five hundred dollars? Would you pay a thousand dollars? We have... already are. Come on, man. This is a hundred a day is a, is an expensive adventure. That's U.S. <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't know because I think it has already reached the pinnacle of what I will pay. Right. Mm -hmm. I've, I, 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 we, and Paul always yell at me for this, but it's like, I'll, I'll fluctuate between deluxe and moderate, depending on the Canadian dollar and whatnot. Um, this is not a $3,500 trip for anyone from Canada. No. By the time you factor in flights, food, accommodation, tickets, like it's pretty hard to get out of there for less than 10 grand. Listen, right. 3,500 Canadian, like $300 US now? Yeah, you know, it's, I'm not, this isn't a $20,000 trip for me. It just ain't. Right. right. I love it. No, again, like I've been, this is not something I don't like to do. I really, really like to go, but 
it can't be a twenty thousand dollar trip for me to go on, you know, Peter Pan for the thirty fourth time. Right? That's the Star Wars world is the thing that 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 has me want to go. And minus Star Wars world, I don't care what happens. Like I know eventually someday they'll reopen in the same way that I know eventually someday we'll get a vaccine. Um, and, and I don't mind that those two things intersect my next visit to Disneyland and the vaccine, but I kind of really want to see star Wars land. It, it trip from heartbreak. It was heartbreaking. We were, um, gosh, it would have been, I think the 13th was our departure and it was around the uh, 10th that we made the decision preemptively to cancel because I don't want to say I had any sort of prescient vision, but you know, we started having a sense that this COVID thing was real and we are asking ourselves like, is this, you know, do we a want to be there if it's actually happening and then b if it goes south and they close i don't think the getting home experience is going to be particularly pleasant and you remember three months ago two and a half months ago what the airports looked like right those horrific scenes at o'hare that yeah, and a car and driving home and we just said look we've been the upside is good the downside is really 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 bad it's like it risk planning 101 right right magnitude impact and decide what you're going to do so what about you? Likelihood, right? So um, I've got an August 30th trip. It, it has not been canceled. However, there are people in my organization, my home organization who would suggest otherwise. I'm less worried about the social distancing aspect because I think there'll be a pretty small number of people there occupancy wise. Um, I am much more concerned about face masks the entire time. Like in the summer in Florida, face masks 100% a period of time. Yikes! I'm not sure I could survive that. Could it, that no, it's not being that bad. To be with the mask outside. But going to the grocery store different than 12 hours walking in Epcot, right? I think that's it's a very different situation. He's like, the mask is not effective that long. What was that? The mask is clearly not effective that long. <laughs> like even if you can wear one all day, the mask yeah. is not effective. The little paper ones that are that are common, they're effective for 30 minutes. Like, like there, there also has to be some consideration given to the fact that while I appreciate what we're trying to do, at the same time, it should be reasonable. Right. Um, and so, like a Disney experience needs to contain by in August 30th needs to contain some kind of recognition that this needs to be a serious thing. Like they should probably have a mask dispenser. It shouldn't be able to be a bandana. We're right. gonna have. And they should probably have those throughout the park. If you have you been wearing your mask for more than an hour, please exchange it here and go in the bathroom and change. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like there should be hand sanitizer everywhere. Um, uh, instead of a napkin holder at the table, maybe a little like, you know, sanitizing wipe holder or something. Because um, I think, uh, and I think you're wrong. I think there's, if they open it and they just open it and they say 100,000 people can show up, there'll be 120,000 people standing outside. I think they're purposely limiting it. I, I, I think it's, yes, 95,000 people will show up, but they're only going to let a certain amount of people in because they don't want socially distant four hour lines. But have you, like, have you, is there some, I haven't seen that. So is there I've some seen, I've seen, I've seen content to suggest that they're purposely going to be doing that. Yeah. And they're doing it based on, because right now you can't actually book a room. Can't book a room, can't book dining, can't book fast passes. Physically impossible to do any of that. So they're going to start to turn that on for the people who already have existing reservations. Um, and then they'll let annual pass holders and then you'll, they'll start to add people. I, the, the only people going to a park is um, people who are staying on site at the moment. Not at the moment. It's starting July 15th. Right. Yeah. But I, I would be fine. I think if outside you don't need a mask inside in a ride, you need a mask. That that's not unreasonable to me. At least it's in the air conditioning for the most part. We'll yeah, I, think, I think it's going to depend. I'm, I'm interested to see how they handle it. And I'm, I am certain there will be plenty of pictures. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, the sit-down dining is going to be interesting. I mean, indoors, as we are starting to learn, has become you know, the primary means that COVID gets transmitted, right? It's almost right. non-existent outdoors. So, you know, am I going to be like, like trying to eat food in the night? <laughs> <laughs> the question becomes, so what am I going to do? Am I, if, I want to go, if I don't want hot dogs for the 44th time, I want to whatever, steak, right? Am I going to get that outside? Is it going to be to go? I have no idea how that's going to work. <laughs> right. It's going to be on a stick. That's how plastic they're sporks. Plastic sporks. All right, Carlos. Good conversation. This has been awesome. Uh, being a fly on the wall and hearing you guys discuss this. Um, before we finish, Mike, 
Any final comments for anyone that is listening? We have talked about the transition of what companies are doing with ML and AI and all these changes in the pandemic. So for anyone that is listening, what will be some of your final thoughts that they should be focusing in their industry and how technology is changing everything after this pandemic? Yeah, you know, ML, I think, really does have a lot of promise for organizations. I think the challenge is, again, separating kind of the wheat from the chaff, right? Getting through all of the endless hyperbole and getting down to brass tacks. What can this thing actually do? Education, right? Two directions. You know, the one, I guess, naturally that appeals to me is learn what it does. I'm not saying go get a PhD, go read artificial intelligence, a modern approach, or any of these relatively complicated things. But you have to develop intuition, right? One of the McKinsey did a great study on this, and it was around why AI wasn't quite as prolific as people might have thought. But one of the primary reasons was because executives didn't know what it did. And it's not because these are stupid people. It's because they don't know. They've never been taught. They've never had to learn. So for anyone who is, you know, kind of early on or interested in getting on that train, understand what it does, right? Really, mechanically. Like, what can it actually do outcome-wise? And then study your industry, right? Look at what other people have done and figure out how to meet in the middle, right? Where I always struggle with a purely inductive approach because it's kind of like, you know, you're throwing darts. Maybe this one hits, maybe you care about that one, maybe you care about that one. Your business is different, right? That's why I think you have to have some understanding of the theory. And it hurts and it's ugly. You got to go read, you got to go take some courses or whatever you're going to do. But I think you have to do that because the other challenge you run into is how do you separate truth from fiction, right? Consultants can come and sell you anything. Mm -hmm. If you don't know what AI even is, and I tell you what it can do, you don't necessarily have a reason to disbelieve me. In fact, you have incentives to believe me because your reputation depends on it because you paid me a bunch of money. Mm -hmm. right? I think you, it's like anything else. You know, I, again, I don't. The other thing to understand is AI is not too different. Right? It is just another tool in the toolbox. So much like we have, you know, executives who understand what a computer does, they understand what the machinery in their factories do. It's another capability. You have to understand what it does. Right? If you can grasp that you're in a position to make intelligent decisions about how to actually employ it effectively, right? Because again, you find it's a solution that is, can definitely be shown to be effective, but it's also fraught with peril, right? It's like, you know, if you, classic example, if you're doing the spam ham problem, right? Is this email spam or not? I don't care why. Build whatever model you want, right? You're making a loan adjudication system. You're making a system about a government allocating resources to one person versus another, right? You better have a really good sense of what the or why that model is doing what it's doing, right? Not it, there's altruistic reasons or just some abstract reason of being generally a good you know citizen or entity, but legal risk, reputational risk, right? these are all things that you have to think about. So education about how AI can go wrong, how it can work, I think is vital for anybody who's thinking about kind of getting on that train, right? You can't outsource all of it. That's awesome. So Paul and Howard, it's been awesome to see you again. Mike, it's awesome to have you with us here at the Sweet Spot. And as always, my friends, make sure that you subscribe to our podcast or our video channel. Share with your team so you keep developing as a leader and other leaders can continue to grow to be the leaders that we know that they could be. My friends, we'll see you on our next episode.